Hi and welcome to another episode of the Leadership Enigma. Well, it's the first episode of a new year. And always I say this, I am really looking forward to this episode. Now, some of you may know that I spent 20 years in law and law enforcement, prosecuting and defending, but also being an operational police officer with the Metropolitan Police. And by chance, we've had the police end attack to us. We've had the Secret Service. We've had the FBI. We've had the military. So maybe there's a bit of a theme brewing. You know what we haven't had is the CIA but we have now. So come back to me just after this break where we'll have the wonderful Rupert Patel, who is a former CIA agent, and we'll be talking about the lessons that she's learned from her life experiences and also her book, From CIA to CEO. Come back to me just after this. You're listening to The Leadership Enigma, powered by Transform Performance International a podcast for the insatiably curious to explore the power of human-centered leadership to create real momentum for positive and sustainable change. Whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts, and disruptors as we discover that success leaves clues. Now, here's your host, Adam Pacifico. So hi, it's an absolute warm welcome to the Leadership Enigma. Rupa Patel, how are you? I am very good and very much looking forward to this conversation, Adam. Thanks so much for making the effort to be with us in person. It's always way more fun yes. for it to be in person. Now, I think I've probably spiked everybody's interest in relation to from CIA to CEO. Mm. And I'm really flattered that we've had a number of people now from what I would describe as high profile first responder agencies. Mm -hmm where there are enormous lessons to be learned. Yep. But like always, can I go backwards to go forwards? Sure. So tell us a little bit about you growing up yeah. and we'll get to how you chose to go into the sure. CIA. Um, so start where you would like to start. Gosh, so I grew up in a uh, immigrant family. My parents are both originally from India. They moved to the US uh, in their early 20s. And I grew up in a very uh, extent, large extended family. So my parents were both the first of their their respective families to move to America. Once they got settled, they helped the rest of their families, their siblings, cousins, extended family members, come to America and, and sort of get settled and create their own lives there. And so I always grew up with this very strong sense of family, yep. having a very expansive notion of what family means and what we do for family, um, but also this idea of helping other people. So, you know, do your best to, to push yourself forward, to grow yourself, to uh, achieve your own inner ambitions. But while you are doing that, at every stage when you are able to do so, to help others. And it was <clears throat> it was a very uh, dynamic environment for most of my life. I've had, uh, you know, both sets of grandparents, multiple cousins, aunts and uncles living with us. And it really, it, it taught me many things. But one of the things that has never left me is how much it taught me that I and maybe everybody need some real alone time because it, in and amongst all of that um, family dynamics, the personalities, the energy, it really highlighted how important it was for me to have my own space, my own private space, my inner world and feed that to help balance and help recharge so that I could then be part of this bigger context and not feel like I was constantly drained. Are you an introvert or an <clears throat> extrovert? It's a really tough one. I think I'm an introverted extrovert or an extroverted introvert because I really do have a very sociable extroverted element to, to my personality. Yep. I feed off of the energy of others. I love groups. I love being in the buzzy environments. But at the same time, I do need that inner time, that alone time, quite literally where nobody is around me um, to the point where, you know, I will sometimes tell my husband to take the kids out of the house, for example, You've because I need your batteries. Exactly. Just a couple of hours of alone time where no one can get to me. Now, I, I love chatting to people about, you know, really their, their childhood. Yeah. And it sounds like therapy and it's not meant to be because yeah. I always say success leaves clues. And I know yeah. people are always thinking, get to the part where we start with the CIA or yeah. where this person is now the CEO. Yeah. But I'm always intrigued because I, I do think that there are clues yeah. in, in, in our backstory. So you came from a, a large, loving 
family which mm -hmm. had a huge impact on you um, education was a big part wasn't huge. it because let's be honest you came from a, a high performing family was, yeah. was dad a surgeon i think mum an engineer you Mom's were a, a great pediatrician, a pediatrician. Yeah. Yeah. okay yeah. Not, <laughs> there you go yeah. I, I don't know where i got that from um but just tell me a little bit about that background did yeah. you feel a pressure to to be the grade a student uh no actually so as you said my dad's a surgeon uh his father was an english teacher in back in india right and my my dad's father fought very hard for and consistently throughout his career as an educator for girls to be able to stay in school beyond just a bare minimum standard yep. which what would happen in india after a certain age girls would leave school so that they could get married and uh you know sort of go down that path yes. and my my grandfather fought very hard for girls to be able to stay educated up until i think high school level at least and that was a very key part of his, his morals and his values which i think were then instilled in my father who went on to become a doctor and then on my mother's side, she, again, came from a line of engineers, which is perhaps where that came from. Okay. Um, and her aunt, uh, so this is back, you know, sort of, I guess, I don't know, in the early 30s and 40s, became a doctor and was one of the first women to leave her village and not just become educated, but then be educated in London, become a doctor. So there was a, from thankfully from both sides, there was a real strong current, which went against the grain of traditional rural, small village Indian society of education, but not just education, educating women in particular. And so I, I had this very strong influences from both sides. And I have an older sister and two brothers. And for all four of us growing up, it was assumed that we would strive as hard as we possibly could to do as well as we possibly could in school. Now, I enjoyed school. I loved to learn. And some it really does fit with my sort of temperament. I was a straight A student. I loved learning. I loved, you know, sort of just studying, um, but I never felt that that expectation from my parents to do well was suffocating in any way. Right. It always felt it was supportive. It was very supportive, and it was nice because they were very hands off about it. They sort of laid this expectation and then left us to it. They didn't micromanage. They weren't stare, hovering over us while we did our homework. They just assumed that they would create the right context and set the right tone and and inform us of sort of certain values but then the rest was up to us and i always felt pressure internal pressure to perform never external pressure and yes we would have those conversations where i would come home and say oh you know you only got a 95 out of 100 what, what happened to the other five points kind of thing but it was less of oh you have to be perfect all the time and more hey let's look at this where did you leave something on the table could you have done something differently to perform better to uh to, to let some of that potential come through or is in this instance 95 the absolute best that you could have done in which case that's fine but it was a dialogue it wasn't this like you have to be perfect and nothing else is is good enough for us but it's a high performing environment that you, you were brought up for sure. in. <laughs> so i'm going to ask you the question that i get asked because I was a lawyer for a number of years mm. before I decided to become a police officer, yeah. a decision my mother never understood, bless yeah. her. And people still ask me that, why would you stop being a lawyer and become a cop? Yeah. And so obviously you made a decision mm. in your 20s, I believe, yeah. is that right? Yeah. To join the CIA. Correct. How did that come about? It was, uh, so I, until very recently in life, was never the type of person who had sort of a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. I always, have um, I still to some extent have a much more intuitive approach and I as I said sort of explored things that were slightly untraditional so I studied political science as an undergraduate student and then I got a um, I, I spent a summer interning at one of our U.S. embassies in Oman right and I saw I, that Oman yeah That's it a was beautiful a beautiful country beautiful right? country it had a, left a real impact on me and because it was this relatively small uh, U.S. embassy I was able to get really in the weeds of the work that we were doing. So yeah. I was having meetings with Omani officials, I mean, uh, you know, along with some of my colleagues, but I was really able to get a, a, an actual taste for what life as a diplomat would be like. And I initially thought that that's where my career would go, that I would become a foreign service officer and, and, and live that life of, right. a, of a diplomat. But when I was studying uh, for my master's, which was in international affairs, I uh, was presented this opportunity to join the CIA as an analyst. And I had never considered the CIA. I didn't even know that analysts were a 
a job at the CIA. My view, like many people perhaps even now, is that the CIA is all spies and sort of going undercover and, and, and doing sexy high-speed things. And for me, the idea of working at a place like that while still be able while still being able to scratch all of the, the itches that I loved, which is getting really smart on issues, sharing that expertise with other people, traveling, learning languages, basically getting paid to be a nerd. It was sort of, it was a no brainer for someone like me. I think I love that you said something in your book and you said it was a common issue, the nerd meets the badass. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I kind of love that as a phrase. Yeah. So it sounds like the CIA may have found you as opposed to you found the CIA. Yeah. It, it, it was a, a meeting of minds anyway. Yeah. Uh, help people understand that we have many analysts within the police, but they yeah. are at the civilian staff and analysts, yeah. not operational police officers. Yeah. Help people understand the role that you had as an mm -hmm. analyst. You still have to go through what training you have to go through and what capabilities sure. you needed to be a, a CIA agent. Yeah. So there were two sides to it. The analytical side, which we did go through a full sort of, uh, I think it was a nine month training program where it wasn't just learning how to interpret data and analyze data, but then also how to make it useful for those who needed it. Yes. So our biggest customers is what, what we would call them, were the president of the United States. <laughs> And not many people say that on my podcast. No, I would imagine not. The president, um, you know, sort of senior diplomatic officials at the State Department, basically anyone who was making a decision on our U.S. foreign policy. Right. And so we needed to learn not just how to analyze the data, but how to present it in a way that it would be useful to them. Because as you can imagine, these people are making decisions on everything. There is some real information overload. Yes. And for us, the skill came in learning how to distill everything to its most essential essence so that they could make more informed decisions. And the, the, the level of detail would be greater or lesser depending on who the customer was. For example, you know, I worked a lot with the special forces and they needed a lot of detailed tactical information, whereas the president doesn't need to know that. He needs to know the bigger picture strategic level detail. And so learning how to talk to the audience that you are in front of was another huge part of our training because otherwise the information is useless, you know, or you're giving it in the wrong format or it's not going to be something that they can act on. And so it was marrying all of the work you're doing internally with how to make it most useful and valuable to the people who are going to use it. So that's the analytical side of Correct. things. And, and what was the training that you had to embark on almost to assimilate into the CIA? Probably the most high profile yeah. uh, instances that are happening on US soil and internationally. Is that what, yeah. what, what how would you describe the remit of the, of the, the CIA? The CIA does all of our uh, external operations and yep. external. Basically, our, our remit was to keep the US safe from all threats, foreign and domestic. Yeah. So it's gathering intelligence going undercover if that's part of your job, um, and then being able to use that information to help law enforcement or, or policymakers yep. keep the U.S. and its citizens and its foreign interests safe. So it's really about making sure that we are operating with the best information in order to further U.S. interests and protect U.S. interests, both home and overseas. Gotcha. And as part of the training, so everybody who starts goes through um, a six-week training program, regardless of whether you're going to be an analyst or a field agent or anything else. So yep. you're in the mix with you know the scientists and the engineers, as well as the graphic designers and the, the case officers. That everyone does together. And then you sort of separate into your specialized training. So I did my analytical training for those nine months. And then before I deployed to, uh, to a war zone, there's an, a, a whole other series of more tactical training. So weapons training, uh, sort of driving training, triage, medical triage training to get you prepared for hostile environment. And so you, you have to go through that in order yes. to cope with the environments that you might exactly. find yourself in. Exactly. Right. Uh, you just mentioned war zone. So yeah. listeners might be thinking, what, what do you mean by that? Or where were you deployed? Can you yeah. give us some examples of yeah. some of the environments you found yourself in? Yeah. So so the, the biggest war zones that we were active in at the time when I was um, serving were in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Yeah. Um, most of my efforts and my time there was working um, in Afghanistan, both from headquarters, but also then I spent some time in the country uh, advising our U.S. ambassador, as well as the uh, the four-star general who was in charge of U.S. and international forces. Gotcha. And so I want to ask you, there was a phrase also I picked up on about mm. st focusing on strengths, not weaknesses. Mm. So as you made the decision to go into the CIA post the, all the training that you had, the analytical training and the basic training yeah. to be ready, um, 
tell us what were you starting to focus on from your perspective in relation to your growth, your learning, your development yeah. in such a high stakes, probably very fluid environment. And yeah. I'm just going from my limited experience of yeah, law yeah, enforcement yeah. now. Yeah. What, what were some of the things that you were picking up on about your strengths and, and, and the direction of travel for you? Yeah, it was two things. Um, and it makes sense in retrospect in particular <laughs> where yep. sort of the threads that were even pre-CIA. But for me, it was, again, bringing order to chaos. So at the agency, there's so many, I mean, you're literally inundated with information. You're, and then there's the political layers, and then there's all of what's happening in Washington, what's happening overseas. And, and that can lead to, again, a lot of just uh, mental overwhelm. Yeah. And for me, I found one of the skills I was best at is being able to, again, to distill all of that chaos, all of that noise into something that was ordered and structured and made sense. And the second thing, which I loved, and this is where I, uh, as much as possible, sort of tried to focus my uh, my career, was in then using that to communicate to others. So for me, my biggest strengths were the analytical side and then the communication side. And learning, as I said, how to tailor what I knew to the person who I was speaking to. So when I was working with a four-star general, you know, blending the right combination of the strategic insights that we were gleaning as well as the tactical insights, when it was um, other foreign governments that we were working with, helping piece together how what they were doing and what we were doing sort of um, worked together and any any uh, sort of dynamics that were arising out of that. But it was that learning and then communicating that was just what I loved to do. Because for me, knowledge is useless unless it is applied. And I didn't want to just be the smartest analyst. I wanted to be a very valuable advisor and a very valuable, um, uh, yeah, I guess sort of co-strategist and, and uh uh, to help inform the policy. Now we talked about the phrase "noise to signal." I think yeah. just before we started recording, and it's yeah. a it's a phrase that that kind of piques my interest because so many leaders now, small, medium, large companies, yeah. are drinking for fire hose, yeah. inundated with data. <laughs> yes. It's impossible to make any decision with all yeah. of the relevant or necessary information. Just yeah. impossible. So, what advice have you got to anyone really leading themselves or mm. small teams or large organisations to help them approach how do they get through the noise? to a signal, yeah. to some kind of an ability to sense make or, or make a decision. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I think for me, again, it comes down to this essence is focus on your mission. So as an individual, that's you. What do you care about? What are your values? What are your goals? As opposed to getting sidetracked by comparing yourself to others or scrolling on social media mindlessly so that you feel like you know you don't measure up to what other peers or, or other people that's good advice for all teenagers <laughs> yeah, listening indeed. right now if there are. um but as a leader it's also focusing on your company because i think too many leaders still are hyper aware of competitors but the reality is only your company or your organization can serve your customers in the way you do it so you don't need to be distracted about, well, this is what they're doing over here or they're taking over this market share. I mean, be somewhat aware of it, but don't get distracted by it because the way you will succeed as an individual or a leader or an organization is by doing what you do best or better. And if you are constantly comparing yourselves to others or other companies, other CEOs, whatever it is, you will never really be able to drill down into what that is and how you can perform at your best. So I refer to this sort of, again, the signal and the noise. Yeah. The noise is all of that, oh, well, this is what they're doing over here, and this is the best practice over here, and this is how uh, you know they've taken over this part of you know that industry or whatever. That's all noise. The signal is, what are we doing internally? What gave us the competitive advantage when we got this you know, client or when we entered into that market? What are our people strengths? What are our technological strengths? What are our uh, you know, other sort of internal tangible as well as um, IP strengths? And then doubling down on those and leveraging those as much as possible instead of trying to be another Microsoft or to be the next, I don't know, uh, Kylie Minogue, you know, it's it's really about understanding what you do best and then just getting better at doing that and delivering on that. And I'm cherry picking slightly in relation to some of the themes that, sure. that I picked out the book as well. But another question just popped in my mind is if you're joining the CIA mm. uh, in, in your 20s, so um, obviously bright as a button, uh, highly enthusiastic, 
What was one of the biggest challenges that you came up early on in your career within the CIA? Was it the analytical side? Was it the comm side? Was yeah. it the politics? Was it big P, small P? What yeah, was it? I think it's both the big and P, a big and small politics. Right. Um, because for me, I am a very action oriented person. Yep. And when I see a problem and I identify a plausibly decent solution, it is particularly frustrating when you can't just tell people what to do or when people don't act on your information. And as the agency, we didn't create policy. We didn't, uh, we could, we were never, we, it wasn't within our remit right. to be directive. We couldn't say, Mr. President, do this or don't do that. Our role, and you I strongly think- strongly advise. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, that's, and that's where I think it's really, really valuable because we can tell you what the information is. We can tell you what our best analysis is, but then it's up to the policymakers and the decision makers to decide what they're going to do with that information. And while it is a very freeing uh, role that enabled us to be independent and I think still the best of the intelligence agencies, it for me personally was really frustrating because you could see what you saw, you know, be really well informed about a particular issue or a country or, or whatever it was, and just see the policymakers sometimes ignore that or not, uh, you know, sort of take the, the policy in the direction that you thought would be the, the better way because they were dealing with their own politics and their own, you know, sort of competing agendas and competing uh, stakeholders, et cetera. So for me, the politics was always the most frustrating. So I want to ask you a question in relation to critical conversations. This yeah. comes up a lot now in, in organizations yeah. that I'm working with yeah. and for leaders of, of all levels to be able to have critical conversations yeah. and they always say that you know in some ways feedback is a gift but people are yes. asking for this particular gift yeah. uh, in any organization really but with critical conversations i always sometimes say to people what's the consequence of you not having the critical yeah. conversation i'm assuming in the cia you can't not have the critical mm -hmm. conversation you can't not brief the president or the senator or the yeah. military or internationally whatever it might be yeah. when something is this high stakes and, and critical yeah. How did you have maybe some of those critical conversations where perhaps you're, it's truth to power yeah. or it's to someone older, yeah. senior, yeah. maybe wiser in, in that sphere, yeah. but you're seeing something, you're trying to help them from the noise signal. Yeah. What are your thoughts in relation to having those critical conversations as, as, a, as a young analyst or even a young leader <clears throat> coming through in that environment? Yeah. So I think first and foremost, to have a critical conversation, you need to have credibility. Yeah. Um, and that can come in many forms. It can come in developing a relationship with someone, uh, having that interpersonal credibility, or yep. it can come just from your institutional credibility, of course, of which the CIA has a lot. Yep. Um, but you cannot have a criti critical, constructively critical conversation unless you have that credi credibility. And I think that's where, for example, for leaders, a lot of the times they only engage when there's time to have a difficult conversation or they only engage when there's a problem. And that is- Might be too late. Exactly, it's too late because you don't have that relationship. You don't have the credibility and then people of course will then get their backs up and get defensive and, and you need to have the credibility first. Right. So regardless of what you're doing, you need to have the relationship and establish that credibility is the essential element. And the next thing is then to rely on the data. For me, data is key in everything and also having that critical conversation with the data so for example when we would have a big analytical piece of which there were often times where we were saying something that was very controversial or something that was slightly counterintuitive or we, that people didn't want to hear or people didn't want to hear we would beat that conversation to death with, well, what about this? And what about looking at it from this angle? And what if this is wrong? Or, and just stress testing our analysis to make sure that it was the most robust and it was dealing with every potential the uh, logical um, sort of challenge to it. It's almost playing devil's advocate. Exactly. So okay. we would play devil's advocate internally. We then would play devil's advocate externally with yep. other um, other agencies and other uh, stakeholders to make sure that we, again, like I said, stress tested that argument as much as we possibly could. And then just using the data to support what our final analysis was. So for me, the data is always there. And it's not about cherry picking what you want to, uh, the data you want in order to justify the answer you want. It's looking at the data that 
goes against what you have to say, goes against what you uh, what your best guess is, and then figuring out a way as how can you how can you weave that in? You know, how can you make the exceptions for this outlier or what you know what can explain this sort of counterfactual? And I think that ability and that willingness to engage with ideas that you disagree with or again data that disconfirms what you believe is an, a crucial element again of having that critical conversation that constructive conversation because then it shows that you have done your homework and then you as the person delivering that message just regardless of whether or not people want to hear it mm. you can say with confidence as i had to do many times well look you know general or mr senator or mr president we know this is an uncomfortable truth, but this is why we believe this is the vast body of information, of intelligence, of analysis that we have relied on to give get to this, uh, get to this uh, answer or to this uh, analysis, and this is why we have so much faith in it. It's not just about throwing out, you know, your first opinion and, like I said, cherry picking the data. It's actually a much more robust process than that. Yeah, there's a lesson in persuasion there as well, isn't there? When, when I'm talking to the trial lawyers and from my previous life, yeah. it was always about state the proposition, but yep. back it up exactly. with the evidence to exactly. support. And I think that's it's what exactly you're saying that. as well exactly that. from that analytical perspective. Yep. Um, I want to ask you another question because some people, as they travel through their careers, they make that journey from a sole uh, uh, contributor mm -hmm. to becoming a first-time leader, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know their leadership will will develop over time. Yeah. So, what was your journey, or was your view in relation to moving from a sole contributor mm -hmm. to maybe now leading and guiding and advising, yep. perhaps more even expert people than yourself? Yep. But you had the information that was critical. Yeah. Any thoughts on, on on advice for anyone who's moving from the sole contributor to more of a leadership? Yeah, I think first and foremost, and in this echo something we said earlier, is to really be very crystal clear on your strengths. Because we are still, I think, slavishly beholden to this idea that we have to work on our weaknesses. And yes, as a leader, especially as you're getting to, you know, high sort of C-suite level leadership, you have to be fundamentally competent at a lot of different things, but you can only be an expert in a few things. So my advice is be good enough at the other stuff that you will need to encounter in order to be an effective leader, yeah. but truly double down on your specific expertise, on your specific skills. But first, you, in order to do that, you need to know what those are. And I think too many leaders, when they're making that transition, have a lot of insecurities around, oh, well, am I ready for this? Is this right for me? And you know, I've never done this before. And then they try to model others. They try to become the CEO who was sitting before them, or they look to another role model, yeah. perhaps, and try to be like them because they think, oh, that person's really charismatic or they were really effective at this. Or, But that's not going to work because that's not you. That's not natural. And I think we need to start expanding the, the paradigms we use as to what we consider a leader because there are plenty of, for example, introverted leaders who are phenomenal leaders. They're not going to be the ones to rile the troops, to go out and you know give these inspirational speeches, but they will perhaps be the quiet thinkers behind the scenes who can have the one-on-one -on -one conversations with the right people internally in order to get things done. And so it's to really, really understand what your strengths are and then focus as much of your leadership on leveraging those strengths in whatever possible. So for example, for me, I know, as I said earlier, my strengths are communication and analysis. So I don't try whenever I can. Yes, I'm competent, for example, at accounting and finance, right? but I'm not going to ever become a financial controller. That's not where my specialty lies. It's in the strategy and in the execution. And if I tried to force myself to begin, become an expert accountant, it would just be a waste of time. And so for all of those people who are on that journey is to really understand what your strengths are and then very, very consciously and concretely figure out, well, how is this going to look in my day to day operations? How is this going to affect the way the team yeah. I build around me as I'm going up the, the organizational structure? And how am I going to be able to live in that? I hate saying this because it's a bit jargony, but that zone of genius as much as possible instead of getting distracted and pulled into, oh, well, you have to sit in this meeting and come, you know, weigh on this decision. You know, for some people, that's where where they sort of come alive and come into their own. But if that's not you, build that into your leadership profile and into your leadership execution instead of just 
repeating what has been done before you. I'll still try and step into that zone of genius at some point, I yeah. must admit. But uh, yeah. there's no cookie-cutter approach no, to this. It's very much that trying to be that authentic self and the yeah. authentic leader. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a number of leaders in your book yeah. um, that you call that Adam, Charles and Samantha, not their real name, but yeah. what stood out from those leaders who were all very different mm. that you thought was worthy of writing about them in the book? What, what, what was it? Was it what, something they said, that they, the actions, how they made you feel? What was it that, that really resonated for you? For me, it was their, if I could distill it into one word, it was their integrity. Okay. Because they were the type of people who said what they did and did what they said. And it wasn't often said, actually. They sort of led through their actions. So for me, what really, insp what really struck home was that they would always 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 be the what the first people to own up to their mistakes they would empower others instead of trying to hoard all of the glory of which there was a lot to be to sort of be passed around right but they would empower others they would let others take credit they would give the sort of the sexy jobs and the and the sort of the sexy postings or the very exciting high profile briefings to those who were most competent and and able to deliver those instead of saying well you know I'm the one who's you know at the head of this table so I'm going to get to be the one who talks to the president or or whatever it was right. and so there was just a real I bet there was a lot of that though that went on of course right? and that's human nature exactly you know people as you said it's human nature to want to hog the glory for yourself to be the one to be seen as doing all of the being behind all of the successes and yeah. all of the the good stuff but they were at, they were very willing to share in the the good and almost hoarded the bad for themselves in the sense that they created this really beautiful again unspoken umbrella over the people that worked for them where when the theoretical shit sort of rolled downhill, we were all protected from it as much as they possibly could. And it wasn't a question of, oh, well, you know, you're going to take the fall for that or you're going to take the fall for that. They they took on the role of leader, which I think is, you know, that idea of the buck stops with you. So if you are a leader, then the good and the bad, you have to take credit for. And they did one that one step further and took all of the bad for themselves and then, like I said, portioned out all of the good. And it was a really inspiring environment in which to work because you knew, one, that you could fail, not on purpose, but as normal human beings will inevitably at some point at all levels of every organization fail, but it wouldn't mean the end of your career and you wouldn't be the one thrown under the bus, um, you know, if it did ever come to, you know, going higher up the chain. And you were also really empowered to succeed because often what happens is egos get in the way. Yeah. People want to take all the great stuff for themselves, but they rewarded competence. So if you were a junior analyst in your early 20s and had, you know, were the most uh, well versed in a specific topic, then you were the one who got to write for the president. You were the one who got to go in front of the four star generals. It wasn't. And yes, they might accompany you for other political <laughs> reasons, but you got to share in the glory. And I think that for me was such a beautiful illustration of what true leadership is. It's not about telling people what to do. It's about empowering them to be their best and to raise the standard. As some of them had really, really high standards, but it made you, or it made me at least, want to rise to those standards because you knew that they would they saw something in you and you wanted to live up to that. And this is good <clears> advice, <throat> isn't it, for so many organizations mm. that are very risk averse, especially mm -hmm. in a highly regulated environment. Yeah. So that could be law, accounting, yeah. Uh, pharmaceuticals, yeah. etc. And I know that there's, they always feel that tension between we're highly regulated, therefore we, we don't like risk in yeah. any way. Well, I mean, you're operating in an environment of pretty high stakes yeah. uh, risk. Uh, let me, I'm zoning in very much on, on the leading aspect sure, of, of the of book, course. but there's so much in it. And I'll, I'll come back to in a moment how people can get hold of the book yeah. and what else is covered. Um, you talked about something called identity driven leadership. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what what do you mean by identity driven leadership? Yeah, so it's exactly that. It's not about sort of uh, demographic identity or ethnic identity. It's identity as who you are. And echoing what we uh, just talked about a few minutes ago, yeah. it's that idea of accepting who you are, not constantly looking for something to fix or another credential to give you external <laughs> validation or another certificate, but acknowledging that probably by the time you've gotten to the point in your career where you are in a position to be a leader, you are who you are, your strengths are what they are, your blind spots are what they are, and to to make as much of an effort as you possibly can to really 
use those strengths to understand them and also to be vulnerable enough and open enough to share where those blind spots are. So you're not going in and expecting people to live up to a certain standard that you haven't communicated or telling them that, uh, you know, things have to be this way and or, you know, it's the highway kind of thing. It's owning that you want things a certain way and communicating what those boundaries are, what those specifics are. It's owning that you will never perhaps be an amazing negotiator, but you're a great strategist. And how can you, again, weave that into your, your role as a leader as much as possible? And so it's going into yourself, first and foremost, doing that self-reflection, understanding who you are, right. what makes you tick, how, you know, where do you naturally find yourself gravitating, both in your career, but in your sort of interpersonal relations, relationships, et cetera, and how that can be weaved into your your career, because that's what is sustainable. That's how you will be a leader or a CEO or whatever it is for decades, by being who you are, by leveraging those strengths, as opposed to by constantly trying to, again, fit a certain paradigm or to be more, uh, I don't know, charismatic or, you know, less... Uh, all things know. to all people, impossible. Exactly, exactly. And also, I think the second element of that is the communication part. So I think too many leaders create this strange environment in which people have to guess, you know, what's going to, what do they need? How can I support them? How, how can I, uh, you know, sort of contribute to their vision or their strategy? I think communication is so, so critical and saying, look, this is what, this is my vision. This is how I want to get there. But this is where I have some blind spots. This is, you know, I don't understand how, for example, to open new markets or how to, uh, you know, sort of create, I don't know, supply chain efficiencies or whatever it is. And then again, let the people around you fill those gaps for you so that everyone is leveraging their strengths. Everyone is allowed to contribute to the success and you're just orchestrating it all as opposed to being the one who's in charge of it all. The tide rises all boats exactly. in a good leader, one hopes. <clears throat> yeah. There's another phrase I wanted to talk to you about and, and I think it flows on from this and that yeah. was tactical ignorance. Yeah. Tell me about tactical ignorance. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's both in that uh, uh, it's a very valuable tool in this information overload that we all confront and knowing how to parse the signal from the noise. So the tactical part comes from choosing the inputs as opposed to just being ignorant, right? We're not about, as a leader or as a human being, one shouldn't bury your head in the sand ever, but it's about choosing very carefully and tactically what are the relevant inputs that I need for the mission or the job at hand. So again, as a CEO, you know, the the relevant information that you should be taking in are of course all of the internal you know, data, the internal dynamics, the internal uh, workings and operations, and maybe a few elements of just having sort of the situational awareness of what's happening in the market, what's happening, you know, in the industry, et cetera, without being obsessed with, you know, sort of reacting to every thing that happens, whether in the market or with your competitors. So it's choosing that data very tactically so that you can focus on your job, which as a leader is to make your organization the best it can possibly be. And the best might be operationally, it might be financially, it might be, I don't know, in some sort of ESG capacity, whatever it is, it's your company, your organization, your values. So being tactical about what you're keeping out and also very tactical about what you're letting in. On a more individual level, it's also about the noise that we uh, sometimes let ourselves get distracted by, both personally and professionally. A very concrete example of this, you know, I was often going into rooms where I was the youngest person, the only woman, the only person of color, the only civilian, you know, many of these things which in many uh, environments would perhaps lead to, oh, well, I don't belong here, and, you know, what should I do, and I'm so intimidated by this person. I was a 26-year-old you know, brown woman, civilian, going in to brief a four-star general who was, you know, three times my age. And I could have let that be intimidating and scary and fumble through, you know, sort of whatever I was doing. But I chose, again, to be tactically ignorant about all of that atmospherics, all of those weird hierarchical uh, sort of, um, well, hierarchies that we create about how important somebody else is and how insignificant we are. I left all of that outside of that room and I said, my job is to do my job. My job is to inform- Focus this on the strength. 
focus on my strength, the analysis and the communication, and get the job done. The job in this instance is to deliver the most informative briefing to this general so he can make better decisions. So I don't need to worry about, you know, who's ranked who and, you know, what's, you know, what's going on and who's looking at who and all of that stuff. My job is to go in and deliver the message and answer the questions to the best of my ability. So focus on that. Prepare as best as I possibly could. You know, make sure that I, you know, anticipated what he needed to know to the best of my ability. And, and when I didn't know, could say, I don't know, but I will come back to you after I find out kind of thing. But not worry about all the atmospherics of like, oh, he's so important and I'm so insignificant. And we do that Beyond your control, exactly. isn't it? Exactly. None and of that. In some ways, this sounds like a great coping mechanism exactly. for anybody. Let's exactly. be honest. We, yeah. you know, we talk to CEOs who say that yeah. they feel like an imposter in certain exactly. environments. So this isn't just about people coming into exactly coming into work. This exactly. is people who might be exiting a wonderful yeah. career after thirty or forty years. Exactly, it's and the it's, same thing. As you say, you know, it's it's in both contexts, whether in a work context or an individual context. Focus on the job. Focus on the mission. You know, as a CEO, it's making your company the best it can be. As an individual, it's delivering on whatever you need to do in that in, in that specific situation. Focus on that and leave very tactically ignore all of the rest. So I've cherry picked just a few things from your book, from yeah. CIA to, to yeah. CEO. Yeah. Um, where can people get the book? Might be a silly question. In no, many ways. everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so it's ev available worldwide, everywhere. All retailers, Amazon, but also you know Waterstones and um, and traditional bookstores. Always uh, nice to see it on the book yes, store shelf. Yes. It has been There's something about that. Right? Very very surreal and fantastic to see it on on bookshelves. Um, for any U.S. listeners, it's actually launching in the U.S. this May. So ah, I know the rest of good. the world got to see it before my own country I feel did. as if I'm privileged that I have a signed copy yeah. uh, right here, which is great. How do people get in touch and carry on the conversation with you, uh, find out more or, yeah. or get you involved in their conversations? What's the best way? Very easy. You can find me on my website and I will respond to any queries. It's rupalypatel.com. RupalYPatel.com, and we'll yeah. put that in the show notes Thank as well you. so that people can access that. Yeah. And you can get this from all the major booksellers, yes, as you, you say, can. online yeah. or in bookstores. Final question. Unfair question, really. <laughs> Is there a piece of leadership advice that really stands out that you've mm. given or received in your life that just floats to the top every time? Oh, that is... Good. Yes. Oh, my God, yes. <clears throat> um, it's actually something my dad said. Uh, it's to live an absolute life, not a relative life. So again, not being caught up in what's that person doing? What's that company doing? That relativism, right? Oh, well, I don't measure up because I'm only making, I know, X number where this CEO is making that or, you know, that person's career is shooting this way and mine is going this way. Or Again, that's relativism. Don't live a relative life. Live an absolute life in an absolute sense. Are you happy with your career? Do you feel like you're contributing? Do you have enough for your, you know, whatever desires are, et cetera? And, and, and let that be enough. And I think that is really valuable, again, both from a personal as well as a professional context, is to focus on the absolute results. You know, did we do well? Did we do our best? Are we making progress? As opposed to the relative results. Well, yeah, sure, we grew, but that company grew 25% you know, percent and we all grew 5%. Again, that's noise. That's distraction. So yeah, live an absolute life, not a relative one. See, that's great advice. I've got two teenagers, and I know you've got you've got two kids who are younger yes. than that. Yeah. It's tough for them, isn't it? Because they are immersed in that relative aspect of yeah. compare, contrast, and in many ways, and so many times we see this. Yeah. There's this. They're not standing up to the the falseness that was almost on the internet. Well, I'm lucky because mine are still very young, yes. so the two year old cannot <laughs> comprehend any of that so, yet. Not on the internet yet. Not yet. Long may that continue. But hopefully, yeah. My five year old, uh, as I was sharing earlier, is one of the wisest human beings I have ever met. I don't know how I got so lucky, but she is one of those people who, in many ways, I almost admire because she is so just has this inner strength and this inner natural sort of confidence where she doesn't do the comparing of like, oh, well, you know, that person has that toy and I don't have it. Or, you know, oh, I don't know, that child has it on that coat or whatever, you know, yeah, kids yeah. care about. She just, she she does her, you know, and it's really amazing to watch. And again, long may that continue. Yeah, exactly. Just don't let them become I teenagers, know, Rupal, I okay? Know, I That's know. my only advice. I have to create some sort of weird <laughs> bubble around her so that she doesn't get pulled into it. But yeah, I so far we're, we're okay, but uh, I'm not looking forward to the teenage years, that's for sure. Listen, I just want to say a huge thank you for the effort 
coming into the studio My pleasure. and being part and parcel of the first episode of the new year yes of the new look yeah. leadership enigma it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for having me thank you very much indeed join us again next week for more tips and strategies on the leadership enigma we'd love to hear your comments on today's show as well as suggestions for future topics and guests Get in touch with your host on LinkedIn or visit the dedicated website, www.leadersenigma.com, powered by Transform Performance International, where you can access our exclusive learning, including books, videos, bonus content, assessments, and more. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.